I want to mention that the British Columbia Institute of Technology acknowledges that our campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations of Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam. Do ECGs, and we do uh, stress tests where we put patients on the treadmill and uh, um, try to stress their heart, put a higher workload on their heart and see how it um, responds. And uh, we do monitoring, which is a, a part of our job where it is a little less patient-based. So it's a nice variety that you get to do um, a little of, um, of everything. Uh, we get to work pretty closely with other health professionals. So we do work and you, you will see us in Emerge. So with doctors and nurses, uh, we also do tests with nuclear medicine. So we put um, a radio, uh, a, a, a nuclear isotope uh, while patients are walking on a treadmill. Um, we do that in conjunction with Nuke Med. And then we do uh, some tests with um, ultrasound techs as well. So just a little bit of information about our program. Our program is considered uh, blended uh, that does uh, the academic courses online. So you do your uh, your your schoolwork online, uh, but after the first 11 courses, uh, students come to BCIT campus and we do like an intensive two weeks of lab uh, where you kind of put all uh, the academic work you've put in, you put it into practice and do some experiential learning uh, you work on all the cardiac equipment and uh, you're able to sort of practice the stuff that you've been doing. Uh, the uh, the uh, two, we have two different um, clinical placements. So we have after our first set of courses, we have one placement that's 10 weeks and the second uh, set of courses. And then you have um, another clinical placement. Uh, so we have clinical placements all over Canada. There'll be a map later on that shows you. Um, we have, you know, a lot in BC, but um, a lot of the other provinces and different cities are also represented. Uh, but the lab is actually um, on campus. Uh, so we do have... Um, we do have um, short-term housing here at BCIT that um, students that are coming from out of town um, have the option to try to apply for. It doesn't work out for everybody, but other, other students in the past have done things like rented an Airbnb together uh, close to campus. So they're having the, ch the chance to uh, visit or get to know their classmates um, a little bit more in person. So one of the things about our program is that um, many there'll be lots of people that will take the cardiology technology program as a base and you can take the program full time or you can take it part time it's under flexible learning and so you have the option how you want to do it you can do it part time some people will take like three courses or four courses a term uh, or you can opt to do the full time model after you finish and you start working, um, we have a fair amount of students, I would say probably close to uh, 20 or 25% uh, that will carry on and they will join one of our advanced certificate programs. Uh, so we have three, uh, one is electrophysiology, the second is cardiovascular, and the third one is cardiac rhythm device. Uh, so the electrophysiology is the EP lab, and that's where uh, they do an invasive test uh, well, where they will um, ablate um, irritable parts of the heart tissue that are causing arrhythmias. Um, and then the cardiovascular program, that is helping in the cath lab. So if you know anybody that's had um, a heart attack that needed to have a stent put in to um, open the vessel, uh, you would do, that would be um, where that area is that you work. And then cardiac rhythm device is um, being involved in patients um, getting devices such as pacemakers uh, put in and then the follow-up. So patients that have pacemakers regularly come to the hospital and uh, techs are responsible for um, checking and making sure that they are um, working and their parameters, making sure that it's working optimally for patients. So yeah, a lot of our, our, our students do end up going into one of these advanced programs after they've been working for a while. So it's just an, another option we have. So our on-campus lab. So these are some images of uh, students in our lab. Uh, this is our simulation area. Uh, that um, you can see on the right. That's one of our mannequins that we have. And um, it's a state of an art building. It's a gorgeous building. 
And I think um, actually whether we have a graduate who's going to speak to it. And I think actually she was in the first group that ever went into the new building. Uh, so it has um, beautiful spaces. It has um, sort of, you know, uh, patient care labs. Then it has these high end fidelity um, mannequins that can blink and they can breathe and we can work in a control room and use the voice uh, for the patient. Um, and they're, they're created so they really do simulate what a hospital room uh, would look like. So it's a, it's a great area to kind of put your hands in and just practice um, and practice and practice for two weeks straight. It's also a great opportunity to uh, connect with your classmates um, because some students do, you know, you are kind of working independently um, at home. And um, from what I can see, when students finish uh, the on-campus lab, then they often are connected and in the courses in the following two terms, uh, they sort of, you know, create WhatsApp groups or they're, they're a little bit more connected because they've had the opportunity to get to know each other for a few weeks. Okay, great. Uh, so the practicums, uh, there's two. So the first one is 10 weeks and the second one is longer, 16 weeks. Um, they focus on different modalities. So you do one area in 10, for 10 weeks. For the first clinical, you go back to courses that expands on your knowledge that you did in the first practicum and the first set of courses. Uh, and then you do a second clinical uh, for 16 weeks. So um, just lots of hands-on in, in a hospital environment. And um, you get lots of exposure to advanced area of practice. So what that means is you get lots of hands on. You get to work in the cardiology department alongside preceptors and you'll work in all the different um, areas that they do. And um, the exposure to the advanced areas is the programs I spoke of before, the advanced programs. As part of our second rotation, everybody will have the opportunity to go to different areas that isn't necessarily in the cardiology department um, and get some exposure of some, some other areas as well. So I would say that that's like a really big highlight. You know, students um, sometimes have the opportunity to go see an open heart surgery um, or they get to go into the cath lab or they get to go see echo um, they might get to go to a cardiac rehab class. So there's different things that um, students are able to um, experience. Oh, so here's just an image of all of the sites we have across Canada. Uh, so we do have close to 30 sites, I believe, um, that we have agreements with. And so those um, staff that are at those hospitals um, are prepared to have our students. They, um, you know, pretty regularly do have students. Um, once or twice a year. And um, it just makes it that you're able to do your studies from home and you're able to do your clinical, um, you know, at, in your in your resident city for the most part um, or nearby, I guess it depends on where, where you live. So the career opportunities are, uh, they are, there is no end to the possibilities at this time. Um, healthcare is really in a place where uh, there's a lot of jobs out there right now. Uh, so here in British Columbia, uh, the employment starts at $34 an hour and um, you can find um, employment in hospitals. Um, sometimes there's medical labs like Life Labs. Um, Life Labs has an office in Surrey where they do scanning. Uh, you could work for a medical device company, usually after you've done an advanced program, um, or some um, cardiologists run their own clinics and they hire um, graduates to work in, in, the, in the clinic areas. Um, and for some people that suits them very well, some of those um, kind of those, those that kind of environment is um, like self-scheduling or you have a lot more autonomy um, and you don't have to work nights generally in a clinic, um, but hospitals, uh, many of them are 24 hour uh, care. Um, for patients and, you know, you find us in mid-sized hospitals, big hospitals and most small hospitals, but the staffing might uh, be less than um, than the, the, the bigger hospitals. Um, but we are getting, um, I think in the next slide is going to show the, um, the, um, all the different health regions. So maybe can we go to the next one, Darren. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, so we're actively working with um, many of the health authorities and um, in their recruitment strategies because uh, there is such high demand um, for cardio techs. So um, when I'm working with Fraser Health, an example would be that 
Um, they have a new cath lab that has been approved and is starting uh, work in Surrey. And there's hospitals like Burnaby Hospital is getting a new area made and um, they are needing em employees as well. Uh, so really, I, I would say that almost everyone, um, we are getting active um, communication with all the health authorities about all the jobs uh, that are available. Um, on Island Health, so Victoria has not been able to fill many positions. I know recently they had, um, I don't know, 12 or 19 positions that were open um, on um, for to try to fill, and uh, they were not getting any applicants from um, anywhere than the, their own pool of people that work there. Uh, so lots of opportunities, and I highlighted Saskatchewan here too. Um, they are... Um, um, when you meet Bryn, she lives in Saskatoon, which I think is reasonably well staffed. Um, but there's lots of other there's other areas in Saskatchewan that that's not the case. Um, and so the government has approached approached us to, um, you know, just inquire about, you know, what are our projections for for the future. And then the other one that I do work with a lot is Interior Health right now. They're very um, active in um, trying to recruit in different areas. Uh, so yeah, so really there is lots of job opportunities right there. There's um, there's such a healthcare crisis right now in terms of staffing. And uh, so this is a great time to come. We just had our convocation this week and um, all the students that attended, all of them are working. So that's that's great, it's great news. Um, so I spoke to a little bit about those three programs that you can ladder into. Uh, so once you've been working for um, a year or two, if you're working in a hospital that has these opportunities of an EP program or um, a cardiac device or cardiovascular, um, there's lots of health authorities that will support you in continuing continuing your education. Uh, so um, some, you know, lots of people will carry on and then do more. Um, the other thing is we have an agreement with TRU. Uh, so our program is um, worth, um, I believe it's 60, um, but I'm not positive on that number, um, credits towards your health science degree. So we do have uh, graduates who will carry on and finish their health science degree at TRU. Okay. This is um, Bryn's slide. So uh, this is, I just want to uh, thank Bryn Lee for joining us. Uh, Bryn Lee is a recent graduate uh, from last year and uh, she's here to kind of give um, some perspective on this, on the, the from a lens from a student perspective. Um, and um, thanks Bryn for joining us. I think I'll let you hop on there. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Brinley. Um, I just graduated the Cardiology Technology Diploma Program here at BCIT in December this year. Um, I went to do my lab, I believe, in 2022, I think. And I found that's when everything really came together. I got to meet all my classmates. I'm from Saskatchewan, so I never really got to study with my classmates or communicate with them much. I was in contact with maybe one or two of them. And this, I felt like I really got to make some really good friends, some people that understood my situation and what all of us are going through as fellow students. Um, the I stayed in short-term housing while I was there. I found the instructors were super awesome, super friendly, wanted to get to know you personally, get help you in any way they could. Um, I got hired at the non-invasive cardiology department at the Royal University Hospital in Saskatchewan during my first clinical. So I am currently still an ECG tech waiting to write my exam this May. So that just shows you can get jobs even before you graduate. Um, and yeah, I found BCIT. I've heard from different students in different programs and different schools. And I've just found BCIT. There seems to be a general consensus that BCIT produces really good students that come out knowing a lot and being really confident in their skills and having no trouble passing their exam, which is what I'm hoping for. So that's great. Yes, we're hoping for that too. Uh, so do you want what was the work, what was the the clinical like? Um, I think the clinical is really good. I feel like 
there's a pretty not steep learning curve, but everything's in theory until you get to the lab. And then that's for me when everything really clicked, you're actually working on real people, putting into action, you're getting ECGs and being asked what they actually mean. So they're sitting there staring at it for an hour in your room, uh, getting time to figure it out. And I found clinical was very similar. I felt like the lab really prepared me, that two-week lab. And then when I went to do practicum, everything, they have you running the ECG, they have you learning the hospital, they have you dealing with the patients. And they're just standing back and saying, I'll watch you, I'll help you, but we want to see what you can do. So that's exciting. Yeah. And so you took the program full time. I did. Yes. Yes. And did you find the workload manageable? Like, what was that like for you? Or did you work? What did you? Yeah, I did. I did not work. I was focusing on my schooling while I was during doing the course. Mm-hmm. I do know lots of people, currently another Saskatchewan student that's in her second year, I believe. Uh, she's working while doing her schooling. So she was doing part time. She said it was quite manageable. I found the course load quite manageable. It is not intensive, but you do have to study. You do have to do the work, but if you do the work, you'll do super good. And like I said, the instructors really want you to succeed. Yeah. So I think too, like time management, right? I think a lot of students will say like that it was really key, especially for an online program. Um, you have to be pretty disciplined with, um, with your, your studies that way. Yeah. You definitely can't just hope you're going to pass the exam you definitely have to do the work, do the homework, do the assignments, actually try to learn instead of just answering the questions. Yeah, um, that's great. So uh, if you have any questions for Bryn on the chat, um, I think you can answer back. You can answer Bryn if you don't mind. Um, and just maybe something else to mention. We sort of have, um, we have um, implemented, um, although you, you get the the courses online. Um, Many of the courses do have virtual sessions where you join in with your classmates um, and either kind of have a lecture from your instructor or like an interactive um, activity that you have to do together. Uh, So it gives it a little bit more space to kind of work with other students as well. Um, That's been... um, that's been um, it, like something that's that's grown sort of over the last couple of years. Um, it's a little bit tricky because, you know, time changes that so we will have students back east. Uh, so, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of scheduling Jenga you have to do. Um, but that is something that um, we, uh, we we strive to do some virtual sessions. Um, I just see some questions in the chat from me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked if there are any tutors. I did not use tutors. I would just message the instructors and they would set a time, set aside time slots, talk to them, go through things. But I do know there are tutors. I don't quite know what website or how you connect with them. But I know yeah. lots of the students that just graduated would be interested as well. Yeah. I think there are some online things. There's also resources at the library. Like it depends what kind of thing, if you need specific cardiology help, you can use your instructor um, or you can use your classmates. And there are, I think, some tutoring available. Um, But here on campus, we also have, um, you know, they have to be here, but you can access it online as well. They have a lot of resources like getting help with writing or editing. they um it's actually pretty amazing some of the things they have are strategies on how to study um so sometimes we'll refer students to 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 some of those um ideas to help them with their studies i'm going to answer the questions at the end right darren i have that right (laughs) sure um perhaps i should temporarily take over from here and uh, okay. go through some admissions information. And okay. thank you very much, Lisa and Bryn Lee, for all that excellent information. You can take a quick uh, break now while I go through some information slides, and then we'll get to the questions and answers right at the end there. Okay, I'll just provide an overview of the application and admissions process. Uh, there are two start dates, uh, two intakes, we'll call them, per year, uh, one in September, one in January. And um, The department will select applicants after the deadline dates, as you can see here, the application period. You can also find this information on the program webpage, the application steps, 
relatively easy. Uh, once the application opens for each cycle, uh, you can log in and review the online application. You can work on filling out the application at your own pace. And it does not go to admissions until you pay the application fee. And the date that you apply does not have an impact on your application. You have until the application deadline date to uh, submit your application. Uh, regarding the application process, you will first uh, review all the entrance requirements and the application processing dates. You'll then uh, upgrade if necessary, and BCIT does offer upgrading courses in uh, many subjects, and program advising can assist you with this. Ensure that when you are ready to apply that you have all your required documents, such as transcripts, ready to scan and upload as PDF files, as um, everything is done online now, and um, bcit.ca slash admission can guide you through the step-by-step -step application process. And once you are ready to apply online, you can visit bcit.ca slash apply. And the application fee for domestic students is currently $90 Canadian. And the application process takes place entirely online, as I mentioned, and therefore you will need to convert any official transcripts and other documents that are required to PDF files. Uh, the entrance requirements are uh, profic proficiency in speaking <laughs> and listening. I probably wouldn't pass that. Uh, two years of full-time education in an English in English in an English speaking country or equivalent test courses. Uh, English Studies 12 at 73%, uh, Pre-Calculus 12 at 67%, Anatomy and Physiology 12 at 67%, Physics 11 at 67 and Chemistry 11 also at 67 and there is a mandatory applicant questionnaire but preference will be given to applicants with uh, related volunteer and or work experience, a demonstrated interest in the field, uh, other post-secondary education, and consistently good grades in previous education. And I just should mention that the uh, mandatory application questionnaire is an opportunity to highlight any non-academic experience you have that will strengthen your application, as well as to highlight your skills and abilities. Uh, the admissions process is uh, first admissions assesses the online application within two to four weeks. Uh, the applications are that are complete are sent to the department and then the department or program will shortlist and select applicants after the application deadline date and admissions will send out acceptance letters and the, currently the commitment fee is $500. Uh, additionally, Please don't hesitate to contact Program Advising if you have a question or you're unsure about something. Uh, they can answer questions regarding entrance requirements, the application process, student resources, success strategies, program schedules, and many other things. And they're available to assist you on specific days. So uh, definitely go to bcit.ca slash advising for the most uh, current and up-to-date contact information and service hours. And now, just quickly moving from the academics, I'd like to let you know that BCIT is committed to supporting students in a holistic sense, which means uh, we want you to succeed not only in your academics, but also outside of school. And some student services are available to you as a prospective student, and uh, others will be available once you become an enrolled student. And here are a few important ones I'd like to mention. If you are Indigenous, uh, BCIT's Indigenous Initiatives Department is there. For you to ensure a smooth transition into your first year, they offer peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, a welcoming gathering place, and provide clarification on Indigenous funding. And even if you are not uh, don't have an Indigenous background and you're interested in Indigenous subjects, you can certainly go there. I'd love to speak with anybody. Uh, BCIT's awards, scholarships, and bursaries are listed on the Financial Aid and Awards webpage. And I'd like to mention that we have a President's Entrance Award and the selection is based on academic achievement, but also volunteer and community service. And you can contact financial aid directly if you want more information about that. Uh, BCIT is committed to providing assistance to students with permanent or temporary disabilities. And if you have been accepted to a program and you believe that you may need accommodation to be successful, I encourage you to contact our Accessibility Services Department. And BCIT's Student Health Services is a health clinic located on the Burnaby campus. Uh, they provide medical care to current BCIT students all year round. It's not a, a walk-in clinic, so you would need to make an appointment, but that's a very important service. And we also have uh, next to them a counseling and student development department, and they're available to help you enhance your educational performance and maximize your success as a student at BCIT. 
And uh, my favorite is the recreation services, and they promote, encourage, and enable the practice of physical well-being. And we consider recreation an integral part of campus life and I welcome all students to enjoy their services, like the brand new climbing wall, a giant gymnasium, and the weight room and everything is um, a very large and fantastic. We would definitely like for you to stay in contact with us and uh, Health Sciences, um, you can find us on social, on Facebook, uh, X, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, or LinkedIn. And also if you'd like to know more about BCIT as a whole, you can uh, check out bcit.ca and find out about tours, um, big info, where we open up the school and you can find out about all the different programs, uh, info sessions like this one, and of course, uh, advising. And that takes us to the questions and answers. And I've seen some activity going on in the chat, but I definitely have not been keeping track. Um, does anyone have any questions that are outstanding they'd like to answer for the group live? Oh, there. I lost track, but I can see yeah. there's a student from, yeah, sorry, I was trying to go and then I lose it. Uh, Kylene is asking, yeah, I think I addressed this um, maybe later on in the chat. So uh, if you're considering applying because we're flexible learning, uh, we are fortunate that we can offer um, potential applicants to take one to three courses before. Uh, and then you have the opportunity to see if you like that style of learning. Um, it's sort of like putting your toes in the water and giving it a try. Um, I do get a fair amount of um, applicants that, that, that will do that. Um, I just noticed someone else was talking about, um, you know, clinical placements. Um, if you live in one of the cities on the map, um, you know, in this, there, there has been times, um, you know, when the job demand or uh, the hospital environments were limited in how many students they could take. Uh, there was some challenges um, finding placements, um, but that has um, long gone. So it's almost like they're fighting over students now because uh, they're so grateful to have them because uh, they want to try to recruit people to stay. Um, and thank you, Darren, for bringing this. I, I see that I didn't catch this before. Um, so this was some details from 2023. Uh, so the correct times is, is the top line. So January 2nd to May 15th uh, is where we are right now. Um, last year, we offered an additional window, which is where that date is from. Um, but that's, um, that was, uh, uh, that was an add-on. Um, and that's the same for the January um, intake. So it is from July 15th to October 15th. Um, and then we offered a second window um, last winter as well, um, just to try to recruit more applicants. So that's where those dates are. Um, we'll have to maybe be corrected before um, on the slide deck. So sorry about that. Thank you for mentioning that. And uh, that, that's my fault. <laughs> yeah, no. <sighs> Uh, yep. Yeah. So the Casper, we've changed it. We're not doing the Casper anymore. Um, we are going to be, um, doing, um, we're going to short list, um, and do like a mini interview. Um, it'll be sort of short, uh, for, um, the, the shortlisted applicants. Um, okay. Someone's asking about more information on cardiac device tech. Um, so, um, you can't find much information on job tasks. So um, yeah, we have, I mean, that's our biggest advanced program. So if you look at our numbers of graduates, that's where the majority of our students um, end up going because they're often attached to the cardiology department. Uh, so in that area, you would uh, have um, a lot of time spent in the clinic. Um, so you might see eight, 10 patients a day uh, with different devices. So there's different companies that do um, that have different pacemakers and you would be checking people's pacemakers, checking the battery, checking the settings um, and um, making any adjustments if you needed to. And then some hospitals have pacemaker techs, join them in the OR or in the cath lab where they put pacemakers in. Um, and you're part of the, um, you're part of the team when uh, the cardiologist is putting the pacemaker in. What's your name is Sheila. Sheila, um, I would suggest if you are a mature student, um, that would be, I would be in your camp too. If you haven't taken these courses in a long time, I'm sure Biology 12 isn't the same as it is now. Um, there are courses at BCIT that are kind of like level of Biology 12 like that. I think maybe Bavina would be able to help me on that, but I'm pretty sure there are some 
um, sort of intro kind of um, that isn't necessarily attached to our 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 cardiology program, um, but kind of a refresher. So I would say that I would say that of the students that I we have had that um, you know haven't been in school for a really long time that they find that helpful. Um, our medical terminology course is a good place to start because it's only one and a half credits, so it's not a super heavy workload, um, and you can probably kind of go from there. Lisa, was the question about anatomy and physiology, was that in relation to the high school entrance requirement? Sorry, I'm trying to find it in the chat and I can't seem to locate it. I know, it kind of disappears, doesn't yeah. it? Maybe I'll try to put it bigger. Um, oh, wait, oh, you can make it bigger. Okay. So... Uh, I mean, if it is for the anatomy and physiology, the grade 12 level anatomy and physiology, we do offer a course. It's Foundational Human Anatomy and Physiology, BHSC uh, 0110. Uh, you could do that with us at BCIT, but you don't have to. If you want to take it elsewhere, that's fine too. We have a number of different upgrading options um, that if you want to take the, any of the, the the entrance requirements outside of BCIT, you can. Um, one particular one, if you're looking for online options, you could do it through uh, an organization or it's it's a database. It's called Online Learning BC, and there's a bunch of different organizations and school districts listed on there. And then you just connect with the school district or the organization that's listed there to see how to register. Um, you can also upgrade through continuing education, adult learning um, through your local school district or uh, even at another college. Now, if you want more information about these upgrading options or if you have specific questions, I do recommend that you connect with us in program advising directly. One thing to keep in mind is that the chemistry uh, 11, we don't at BCA2, we don't offer an upgrading course that's equivalent to chemistry 11. So if chemistry is something you need to upgrade, you will definitely have to do that elsewhere. Thank you, Bavina. Um, yeah, so I think, I don't think I addressed um, Sheila's question about the, the entrance requirements. So um, we used to have recency uh, within five years of, of doing a lot of our courses. Uh, and I'll say that, you know, industry, we got a lot of uh, feedback from stakeholders uh, that, um, you know, it, I, we're not alone. There's other programs that took the recency away too. And it was, it's more giving uh, the, the potential student uh, the choice if um, they feel like they need to upgrade or take it again, or if it's sufficient. Uh, and we found that a lot of people might have carried on into a job where uh, they are using the, the knowledge or the skills that they had uh, from um, earlier on um, their, in, in their education. Uh, so they don't necessarily feel like they need to have it. So that's kind of where the recency got um, taken away. Um, and um, I think somebody else asked, I saw another question, um, oh, about how many applicants we get uh, and how many of those get into the program. So we'd like to increase our numbers of the people of the amount we're taking. Uh, we've been hovering around the 20 mark of accepting for fall and for winter, uh, but we're open to um, increasing that because of the job demand is so high. Um, and it really depends. Like there seems to be, um, it's hard to predict. Sometimes we get a fair amount of applicants, like 70 to 90. Um, but the last year, I would say it's definitely lower, more like the 30 or 40. So a lot of people are getting in. Okay. Kyleen asked about the performance in the courses. If you take individual courses, uh, we do we do look at um, the marks. Like it's, it's kind of a whole package. Um, and I just want to mention too, as I know Darren said something about the the questionnaire. Um, the questionnaire is um, where you are weighted heavily. So I would encourage anyone who's considering to apply uh, that you're really putting a lot of time and thought um, into your responses um, and really trying to showcase all the things that you've done. Uh, so, I mean, if if it was me, that's an area. If I took some of the courses before uh, being accepted, I would highlight that in areas of the of the questionnaire that um, you took the initiative to take the courses, what you liked about them. So it kind of gives whoever is evaluating the questionnaire um, a sense of, um, you know, if you think you would be a successful learner um, online or in a blended program. I felt like I interrupted you, Bivina. Did you have something else? 
There was a question about the cost of the program, and um, I thought I had an estimate, and I just want to make sure that that estimate is still correct. I said about the estimate, well, it's tuition is due on a course by course basis, so you're only paying for what you're registering into, um, and every year tuition does increase by about 2%. Um, so for the program, I've got the estimate as being about 23000 is that correct? I think that is correct. I do, I can't look it up right now, but I have it in a document. But I think that is around how much it is. Brinley, do you know? <laughs> you just finished paying for it. It is roughly around that. I think ours was like 22, I believe, 22,000. But again, it's course by course, so. Yeah. Yeah, if it's a higher credit course, it's it's more money. Um, so someone's asking about the questionnaire. The questionnaire is one of the pieces for the application. Uh, so it's your marks, but it's 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 a it's um a form that you fill out that has some guided questions as to uh what your why you're interested in the program, what your work experience has been, or volunteer, and even I mean people get you know they really feel like if they don't have any um experience like in healthcare that that's um against them, but it's not. If you've had any experience with um customer service. Um, I would highlight that because there's there's aspects of customer service uh, that you want to take um, into good patient care. The question about cardiac rhythm device tech the, for the advanced program. Mm -hmm. I think I did that one. I just talked to about it though. Uh, can work any volunteer in healthcare? Oh, really? Most um, hospitals do have a volunteer program. Uh, so, you know, the jobs are like greeting and emerge or in the, there's volunteers in every hospital that will help. Um, I think they're called navigators. They will um, help patients get to where they need to go. Uh, so yeah, there is opportunities for sure. Um, if you, if you wanted to volunteer. Um, somebody did so ask earlier, um, what kind of careers they can look at, like a full-time, part-time coming mm. out of the program and I mean it's kind of different for every province in Saskatchewan uh you can correct me if I'm wrong Lisa if you know uh -huh. but in Saskatchewan you can only get hired casual as a student and then once you're like done your schooling you can take on temporary positions but you can't take on permanent and that's only conditional if you pass your exam and then it kind of it kind of depends province to province what's available. I know BC is like pretty high demand right now. Yes, it is very high demand. But I wouldn't say people are not working or not. Um, they're not getting hired into full time positions um, or even permanent positions. There's a lot of temporary positions. Uh, but I will say that. Um, times are different, you know, I feel like that's actually very popular um, because when we hear from graduates, you're able to shift to different hospitals. Like, for instance, here in the lower mainland, I think we have 12 hospitals that um, have cardio techs. Um, and in your health region, like Fraser Health, say, I think there's eight hospitals, maybe or seven. Um, so people will actually take a line in a different area. So you might work at one hospital, you do that for six months, and then you can post into a job somewhere else. So it's kind of giving people variety. Um, and also, there's a lot of you have a lot of choices, because um, definitely lots of people, you know, have children, or they have other jobs, they have other things going on in their lives, and they are looking for for sort of um, something that fits well with what they're doing. So I do find people kind of shuffle around, uh, which from my experience, um, when I graduated, I worked at four different hospitals casually, which kind of means like on call. Um, and I really enjoyed it because it gave me the opportunity to get um, embedded in different departments and see what I liked about it. And I uh, was able to... Um, sort of get an idea of which program or which hospital I was keen on working in um, longer term. So I, I liked it. And lots of times, especially right now with a casual position, you can get lots of shifts. Like I'm casual right now and I'm just coming off a bunch of nights. So. Right. Yeah. A lot of you can work full time if you want, but that's the thing is you have the freedom to say yes or no, um, or you have the freedom to, um, you know, give your availability or accept a shift or not. So if you have something booked, 
uh, then you, you, you can just decline it. So I do feel like that's sort of a piece that, um, you know, that people do actually really like. So, and you just have the opportunity that if you want to work full time, you can, uh, and if you prefer the casual aspect, you can do that too. Great. Thank you, Lisa and everyone. I just wanted to mention that we've gone a, just a couple of minutes over. So I put okay. up this um, program advising email address and uh, you don't need to write it down because I'll reiterate that a copy of the slide presentation and a link to the video recording will be sent out to all registrants uh, sometime next week, probably later in the week. And um, yeah, I certainly want to thank you, Lisa, for being here, program head. Uh, Bryn Lee, our recent grad, thank you very much for sharing your experience. That's super important. Uh, Bavina from Program Advising, thank you so much for taking a hold of the chat there and answering so many questions. And uh, hopefully you'll get some more from this email address. And I really want to thank you all for being with us today and uh, wishing you all the best in health sciences or whatever mm -hmm. you choose to do. But thank you so much for coming out. Yeah, thank you so much. And have a great night. Mm -hmm.